Hey, Anime Stark fam. New series alert, Deku and the Dragon, an unlikely love story. My Hero Academia meets mythical romance. Smash subscribe for part 1. Let's dive into Deku's unexpected love story with a dragon. Ready? Go. Her life was never really special. She grew up as the only child in an ordinary family. Her dad was always a thoughtful and hard-working man, while her mom was gentle and funny. She was happy in those innocent days of childhood when she dreamed of being many things. However, like most people, she woke up to her uniqueness, which would significantly shape her life. She was born with a surprising quirk for her generation, the ability to turn into a dragon. It's something any guy would want, but as a girl, she wasn't thrilled. Number 5-year-old girl wants to be compared to a fierce fairy tale creature. Nevertheless, she learned to live with it, partly thanks to her parents and also her close friends. She continued her life like any other girl her age. She went to school, had average grades, participated in school events, and spent time with her friends until she finally graduated, facing the moment to decide her future. There were things she was interested in, being a veterinarian, architect, or swimmer. These careers caught her attention, and personally, she felt motivated to give any of these three options a try. But, in the end, she came face to face with the reality she was living in. She lives in a society of superpowers, where being a hero is a profession studied in specialized schools, working together with the police to make the streets safer. Usually, becoming a pro hero is the goal for anyone with a strong quirk. Ryuko Tatsuma, born with the ability to become a powerful dragon, was somehow obligated by the expectations placed on her to become a hero. She faced this dilemma all the time. Comments like, you'd be a famous hero with your quirk. Or someone must be crazy to fight against a dragon, or you have a bright future as a professional, Tatsuma-san, precisely pushed her to the decision to join a hero school. She didn't disdain the work heroes do, but she didn't like risking danger or hurting others. The idea of fighting every day, risking her life, terrified her. But everyone said she should be a hero and expected her to be one, so she had no choice but to respond to all those who praised her uniqueness. She entered one of the best hero schools and started preparing to be a pro hero. Honestly, her years in the academy weren't as bad as she expected. While there were specialized subjects for the profession, it was otherwise like a normal school where she made friends and good memories. Her perspective changed when she graduated and started working as an intern in an agency. She fought against real villains and likewise managed to save people using her quirk. Over time, she adapted to her life as a recognized professional hero known as Ryukyu, the dragon hero. While being a hero wasn't something she initially desired, she could now sympathize with the idea of helping people and seeing their smiles after being saved. It became something to motivate her to be better. She could make a difference. Her uniqueness served to help people and stop criminals from causing harm. Even though it was challenging and there were difficult moments, she was able to be useful to others and feel good about herself for doing the right thing. Years of effort and hard work brought her to the present, where she, as an experienced hero, patrolled the city from the skies in her dragon form. Soaring through the sky at a reasonable height, flying above the buildings with her attentive gaze on the streets where some people looked up when they noticed her. Recently, there has been a growing increase in crime rates in the city, and it's up to the professionals to increase patrol hours. Certainly, Endeavor's figure helps a lot to deter many villains, but it can't compare to the times when All Might was the symbol of peace. The dragon hero's attention was caught by the rising smoke from a square where several loud noises could be heard. The dragon narrowed her eyes and quickly flew to the scene, where in less than a minute, she hovered above the square to assess the situation. A robust villain was shooting air blasts from his mouth at a hero who caught his attention, giving civilians time to move away. This was enough for the hero to narrow her eyes and descend towards the villain, who also noticed the great dragon descending rapidly. Get out of here, roared the furious criminal before shooting an air blast at the professional, who easily dodged the attack and proceeded to land on the villain with force, pinning him to the ground using her large claws to hold his head down so he wouldn't cause more harm with his quirk. The hero Ryukyu stopped him, exclaimed one of the few civilians at a safe distance who watched the dragon hero's action. She's awesome. Celebrated other relieved witnesses that the criminal had been stopped. The hero who had been fighting against the subject approached with a smile. Thanks for the help, Ryukyu, thank the grateful man to the dragon for arriving before he could cause more damage. No problem. Recently, troublesome guys like him appear often, so patrolling is essential, calmly replied the hero while keeping the robust criminal, whom the local hero was restraining with a thick steel rope, trapped. The big guy resisted but was completely unable to shake off the dragon heroine. Escape, Aniki, he shouted to his hidden companion, 
now having the chance to get away from the heroes. From one of the roofs of nearby shops, the missing villain jumped. He was slim with spiky hair, floating in the air, thanks to his quirk. See you later, useless heroes. He taunted, shouting as he distanced himself. You won't get away, roared Ryuko, about to take flight with her large dragon wings. However, this action turned out to be unnecessary when a green blur stopped the villain. Huh? said the confused villain, realizing he was hanging in the air, caught by a thick black whip-like thing wrapping around his torso and arms. The eyes of several civilians widened as they recognized the hero who had just arrived. It's Deku, shouted the fans of the young man with green curls, suspended in the air while holding the villain with black wisp. Ryuko felt much more relieved seeing Deku, mainly because there was no way the second villain could escape from the guy who defeated Shigaraki Tomura. Deku, with a smile on his face, descended slowly to where Ryuko, the other hero, and the police officers who had arrived to cordon off the scene were. Sorry for the delay, I had to come from the neighboring city when I got the call for reinforcements, the young hero apologized a bit embarrassed for his lateness, while the local hero approached him. Don't worry, Ryukyu took care of the other villain, replied the hero calmly, using another steel rope to restrain the second villain, allowing Deku to deactivate his black whips. And you captured the one who was about to escape, added Ryuko with a small smile as her size slowly reduced, returning to her human form, the appearance of a beautiful woman with short blonde hair, yellow eyes, slitted pupils, and sharp teeth. As usual, she wore her hero costume, consisting of a traditional red chi pao with open scales on the sides up to the hip, a pair of bracelets, a headband adorned with a claw-like accessory, and decorative wings on the back of her head. She also wore earrings with spikes. The heroine crossed her arms and calmly approached the young green-haired hero, who widened his smile upon being in front of her. It's good to see you again, Ryukyu-san, said the freckled young man, slightly taller than the woman. The feeling is mutual. I haven't seen you since that operation in Okuyama. Honestly, I'm still surprised that you managed to carry that building with just one arm. You did really well on that occasion, praised Ryuko, referring to the time they had the opportunity to work together a year ago. T thanks, to be honest, it means a lot coming from the number 6 hero, replied Izuku, smiling a bit embarrassed as he scratched his head. He never gets used to receiving such praise from professionals he has admired since before entering Yue. Ryuko looked at him intently, at the young man who not many years ago was an aspiring hero and now is a rising hero with quite some popularity. It's reassuring that despite this, he remains focused on the priorities that come with being a professional and doesn't let fame get to his head like many do nowadays. The woman looked around as police officers arrested the two villains, and several people approached the police line to get a closer look. She smiled slightly and greeted the civilians, who were excited about the friendly gesture of the heroine. Um. Ryukyu-san, timidly called Izuku to the professional, who turned to look at the green-haired guy, who was looking in another direction with a faint blush on his cheeks. What's up, Deku? Ryuko asked with a small smile at the freckled green-eyed boy, who became a bit nervous. W well, I don't know if this is the most appropriate moment, but I was wondering if I could have your... Um. Autograph, Deku asked a bit embarrassed as he extended a pen and a mini notebook to the woman, who was slightly surprised. That's... Unexpected, Ryuko said a bit taken aback. She didn't expect him, as a fellow pro hero, to ask for something like that right now. Despite his nerves, he still seemed enthusiastic. I've been a fan of yours for a long time. It was great the way you saved people from that plane that crash-landed four years ago in Tosa Bay, exclaimed the green-haired guy with a brief sparkle in his eyes. So if it's not too much trouble, I... Um, he added awkwardly, looking away. Ryuko smiled gently and closed her eyes. I'd be delighted to give you an autograph, Deku, replied the blonde woman, kindly accepting the pen and notebook to leave her signature on one of the many blank pages. I didn't find the chance to ask when we were so busy on the mission to rescue Iri chan said Izuku with a small smile as he scratched his cheek with a finger. We had our priorities clear back then, Ryuko said, closing the notebook and returning it along with a pen to Deku. By the way, how's it going now that you're a more experienced professional? She asked calmly, curious about how he has adapted to the job after a year without talking to him. I still can't say if I'm doing well, but I'm trying, assured the young hero with a determined expression and attitude making it quite clear to the heroine that he takes his role as a hero seriously. Have you formed any teams yet? Ryukyu asked with a small smile, crossing her arms. It wouldn't be a surprise for such a popular hero to have an equally promising team to work with. Several of my friends from Class A have offered, but for now, 
I prefer to assess how much I can do on my own, he replied with a smile, looking at one of his fists in front of him. Then I suppose you're going to create your own agency, Ryuko said calmly, looking at the green-haired hero, who surprisingly shook his head. A hey, actually, no, replied Izuku, smiling a bit embarrassed. I don't think I'm capable of running an agency like Senapeter or you. I'm better at fieldwork, and paperwork, like reporting every incident, is not my strong suit, the young man said calmly, and at that moment, he received a transmission through the communicator in his ear, changing his calm expression to a professional one after hearing the message. This is an example, I respond to emergency calls to lend my help as an independent hero, he said, rising into the air with float. If you'll excuse me, I have another place to go, Ryukyu-san, he added politely as a farewell to the heroine. She felt motivated by Deku's dedicated spirit and transformed into her dragon form. Can I go with you? Ryuko asked with a smile, sharing the intention to offer her help wherever it's needed. Izuku smiled and nodded. Having the support of a hero like you would reassure me a lot, honestly replied the young hero, floating in the air and then taking flight to the location where the request for help was issued, followed by the dragon heroine who stirred the air with the beat of her large wings. In this way, the dragon heroine followed Deku to what would be the next incident to deal with. As usual, being a hero is not easy, but to be honest, the attitude of the guy helps a lot to set aside difficulties and focus on what really matters, saving others. She was genuinely amazed by what she saw with her own eyes a few minutes ago. She and Deku arrived at the scene, and from a distance, they could see minimal damage to the shops around the park, while civilians had already fled from the five villains with mutation quirks, who had been fighting against two professionals who were notably injured and tired. As she began to descend, she was surpassed by Deku, who descended so quickly that he left her behind, without a hint of doubt in his movements. He made no mistakes when he expelled his black whips to catch the five villains, then retracted his arm to pull them towards him, and with his other arm, he struck the air, causing a strong air blast to overwhelm the criminals who fell unconscious to the ground, all in less than a few seconds. The police officers didn't take long to arrive to arrest the criminals while Deku attended to the heroes while waiting for the paramedics. Civilians gathered around the area, drawing the attention of the green-haired hero, who dedicated some of his time to them before saying goodbye. Ryuko was sitting on the edge of a building, she had been sitting there for a while, carefully watching Deku. The way he faced the criminals without fear, the kindness with which he attended to the injured professionals, and the confidence he conveyed to civilians with that smile on his face. It's curious, somehow he manages to make something so normal for a hero special in some way. She saw no need to descend, after all, she would only attract attention when she couldn't even help. It would be better to wait quietly for Deku to finish attending to his admirers. And after a few minutes of waiting, she watched as he flew in her direction. As sorry for taking so long, Ryukyu-san, apologized the boy with a smile, stopping in the air in front of the heroine. The woman smiled. I got another surprise, commented Ryuko, crossing her arms with charming calmness. Why? asked Izuku a bit confused. It seems like you had everything under control. I should have expected it. It's clear that you now perfectly control your quirks, the blonde replied, honestly praising the young hero's skills, who performed much more efficiently than an average pro hero. I still have a lot to improve if I want to be number one, said Izuku humbly as he scratched his neck. It's good that you aim high. Just remember, it will be tough to surpass Endeavor. After all, he is our symbol of peace, Ryuko said with a smile and closed eyes. She had to warn him because expectations can be tricky. But he didn't hesitate for a second to respond. I'll do my best. I won't give up, declared Deku with determination in his eyes and a genuine smile, surprising the blonde heroine whose eyes widened slightly. Despite the difficulty of becoming the best, with just two words, this guy made her understand one thing. If he can move his body, then nothing will stop him from striving for his goals. The conviction that the green-haired boy conveyed with his brief answer was impressive. A new transmission came to Deku's communicator, while Ryukyu's phone started ringing, signaling the end of her patrol hour. Both had to part ways from this point, with the sun beginning to set in the background. It seems we must say goodbye for now. I have to return to my agency, Ryuko said with a small smile as she stood up and turned her back to Deku. He nodded in agreement since he was needed in Okinawa for two villains with enlargement quirks who were causing trouble. Ryukyu-san, Izuku called to the heroine, who turned to look at him over her shoulder. Thank you for coming, expressed the freckled hero with closed eyes and a faint blush on his cheeks, an expression that puzzled the woman for a moment. But I didn't do anything, she said, confused by the undeserved gratitude she was receiving. What did she do to make him, thank her? 
Even so, you came ready to help. That alone is a great merit, explained Izuku with a joyful and innocent smile, genuinely pleased that Hiro Ryukyu was just as Nehire described her, a truly kind person. Despite being able to continue her patrol without worrying about another incident, she voluntarily decided to accompany him, even if it meant leaving her guard zone. She was very considerate in offering her support. Ryukyu smiled subtly at the young man who was captivated by the beauty of the heroine. You're a good kid. I hope we meet again, Deku, said the woman kindly, proceeding to transform into her dragon form. I hope so too, Ryukyu-san, replied Izuku, turning his back to the heroine and starting to fly towards his next destination, just as the dragon heroine took flight towards her agency headquarters. That afternoon, they went in completely opposite directions, but still, their minds unconsciously pointed to the same thought perhaps they would meet again. The routine became a bit harder to bear, wake up, go to work, and then return home to rest. That's what she had been accustomed to for years as a professional, but it was only recently that it seemed like something was missing to feel at peace again. It's not something she can explain, she doesn't even understand where that restlessness in her chest came from in the first place. But if she had to say something, she would risk concluding that it all started that day two months ago when she met Deku in person. But exactly what started? She doesn't know, she has no idea. The truth is, her curiosity isn't strong enough to want to find out. She can live knowing that since that day, they haven't met again. It's not something she gives much importance to, but still, the essential question remains, why has she not felt completely at ease since that day? Anyway, that is an unimportant dilemma. Today, on her day off, she doesn't have to worry about details. On days like these, she has the opportunity to relax and spend time with friends. Come on, Ryuko, don't hold back, exclaimed the loud and excited woman sitting beside her, hitting her back without measuring her strength, urging her to drink her cocktail with the same enthusiasm she drinks her beer. Apparently, the criteria she uses to choose her friends have not changed since high school. For some reason, she always associates with outgoing and energetic people who contrast with her reserved and calm personality. Rumi Yusujiyama is one of those friends she made once she became a professional. Not for any specific reason, it just happened that both, being the same age, got along more easily on missions they did together. And today is one of those nights when Rumi invited her to drink at a bar, and not having other plans, she simply accepted. In that aspect, she appreciates having the brunette as a friend because she usually takes the initiative for anything, and Ryuko, being a complacent person, accepts it willingly, as otherwise, Rumi would go to her house and force her to accompany her. That's how she finds herself here sitting on a barstool with a martini in her hand and her noisy friend sitting beside her. At the moment, they were not the heroines Ryukyu and Mirko, just Ryuko Tatsuma and Rumi Yusujiyama. And as such, they went out to relax in civilian clothes like any normal person. You've barely drunk, Ryuko, give it a good sip. Encouraged Rumi with a big smile to her friend, who has been calmly drinking her cocktail since they arrived. I'm fine like this, said Ryuko with a small smile preferring to maintain her own pace of drinking rather than matching her friends. Knowing herself, she doesn't want to do anything foolish if she gets drunk. Rumi approached and put her arm around the blonde's neck. It's exciting, isn't it? There are still villains out there to kick in the butt, the white-haired girl said excitedly, blushing due to the alcohol. We're not working right now, don't get too excited, Ryuko said sternly, knowing firsthand how Rumi gets with alcohol, she starts rambling and saying incoherent things. Cheer up. Both of us are going to teach them a lesson, exclaimed the energetic brunette, raising her beer mug in the air, grabbing the attention of some other customers who quickly returned to their own business. It's not unusual to see the hero Mirko making a scene in a bar. The blonde woman sighed. You're very difficult to handle when you drink, Ryuko said, overwhelmed by her rabbit friend's energy, who was taking a deep sip of her blessed elixir. Ha! Huh. Rumi exhaled satisfied, banging the bar with her beer mug. Look who just arrived! The weakling, she said with a sideways smile, noticing the man who had just entered the place and was approaching them. Greetings, greeted Ed Shot calmly in his civilian clothes. Hey Kaminara, also taking a break, I suppose, Ryuko greeted her fellow hero with the same calmness, who took a seat on the stool beside her and nodded. That's right, my agency members insisted, the man replied calmly, closing his eyes, although he wasn't entirely in favor of taking the day off when crime has been rising recently. Bias around, Weakling, Rumi said to the grey-haired man with a big smile, who glanced at her with seriousness. Quiet, you have your own money, Shinya rejected with a hint of annoyance in his voice. For some reason, Mirko always teases and messes with him, 
refusing to indulge that noisy woman. Ryukyu smiled amusedly as she leaned back on the stool. You get along as well as usual, she commented, then took a brief sip of her martini. Do you think so? Honestly, I can't stand her, replied Edshot, closing his eyes and taking a sip of the drink he ordered a few moments ago. You're too weak for me, I want someone stronger than me. Rumi asserted loudly, then took a deep sip of her beer mug. It's curious how these kinds of moments are quite enjoyable for her. When she doesn't need to be the reliable dragon heroine and can just be a woman having drinks with work colleagues, hanging out with those she can call friends. Unfortunately, she still feels like something is missing. The bartender behind the bar heard some customers at the back asking to put the news on quickly. He grabbed the remote control, turned on the television, and switched to the indicated channel, capturing the attention of everyone present. Ryuko, Rumi, and Shinya widened their eyes as they saw the message, disaster in Osaka, just like the rest of the clientele tensed up seeing the images on the screen. It showed a large part of the city being ravaged by a numerous group of villains. Several buildings were on fire, screams echoed in the background, and consecutive explosions amidst all that chaos. It was a disaster unfolding in the most populated area of Osaka. Several heroes were trying to fight the villains and simultaneously evacuate civilians, but they were vastly outnumbered by the villains spreading destruction in their wake. People were fleeing for their lives while the large group of villains remained united in a constant march, working together to devastate everything in their path and harm the heroes prioritizing the rescue of endangered civilians. To anyone's eyes, it was evident that it was a one-sided encounter in favor of the evil group, there weren't enough heroes to stop them. As we can see, the heroes in the area are being overwhelmed by the villains. We hope that Endeavor and Hawks arrive quickly to prevent further destruction, the reporter said seriously from a safe distance from all the chaos taking place behind her. Ryuko bit her lip, furious and frustrated at the same time. Even if she turned into a dragon and flew there now, it would take at least two hours to reach Osaka. When she arrives, all she would find is a lamentable scene of the destruction caused by the villains. She can't get there in time. What is that in the sky? exclaimed the surprised journalist, pointing to the sky. The camera focused on a distant green dot descending from the sky like a shooting star. That dot fell with such force in the midst of that chaos that the earth shook, the air trembled, and strong gusts swept the place, causing dust to rise and obstructing the view of the viewers who were eagerly waiting for what was about to happen, wondering who had arrived to change the tide of that desperate situation. The breeze blew away the dust cloud, revealing the imposing figure of Deku, who was covered in green lightning, his serious gaze fixed on the numerous group of villains in front of him, who were a bit disoriented by his intense landing. It's the hero Deku, the reporter exclaimed, amazed, and various exclamations of excitement were heard from the bar customers. Ryuko felt a brief sense of fear when she saw him standing there. While his arrival meant great help for the heroes and civilians, they were still outnumbered by the massive group of villains. Just the thought of what could happen worried her. On the screen, Deku talked to the heroes around him. They seemed hesitant at first, but with a smile, he convinced them. Reluctantly, the professionals dispersed to rescue civilians trapped in the debris and flames. The young hero stood in front of the villains, ready to face the pro hero with various quirks. It seems Deku is ready to fight while the other heroes save the victims. Will he manage to buy enough time? Narrated the reporter as the camera switched to a helicopter view of the battlefield. About 60 villains organized against the lone hero, possessing a variety of dangerous quirks. From any perspective, Deku was in danger. Be careful, she whispered, watching the scene with concern. In the blink of an eye, he disappeared, causing an explosion in the midst of the villains. Deku initiated the combat, and criminals began attacking with their quirks. Numerous attacks filled the air, all aimed at the pro hero. He evaded them using his strength to redirect and counter with punches and kicks that knocked villains out of the fight. Various projectiles were shot at his back, but he dodged them by rising in the air. However, an unexpected powerful energy blast pushed him into buildings. Despite the damage, he immediately headed back to the villains with a smile, revealing his vulnerable back. He fought fiercely, dodging and counterattacking at every opportunity, using quirks from previous one for all users. Despite receiving several dangerous attacks, he kept going, defending heroes rescuing civilians. With a defiant smile, he took down villain after villain. That's it, exclaimed Rumi excitedly seeing Deku send dozens of villains flying with a burst of air from a punch. The battle lasted about 15 minutes, and the pro heroes evacuated all civilians. Deku's smile widened upon receiving the news, sending shivers down the remaining villains. However, they persisted. Those who could still fight, 
who could use their quirks one last time, gathered to attack Deku, standing several meters away. The villains charged a joint attack that, if dodged, would destroy the refugee area behind him. Undeterred, despite blood dripping from his forehead and his hero costume torn and burned, Deku stood firm, determined to end the fight with his next move. The villains unleashed a massive onslaught of attacks merged into a whirlwind of quirks toward Deku. He regulated his breathing, pulled his right arm back, and green rays manifested his power. Just before the attack hit, everyone saw the familiar figure in him, the emblematic All Might, who smiled and shouted, Smash, Izuku's powerful voice echoed despite the distance. The collision caused a powerful tremor and intense air bursts, destabilizing the helicopter and knocking the cameraman and reporter off balance on the ground. The viewers couldn't see the impact due to a thick layer of dust and smoke. Ryuko was visibly tense and worried, standing up with her hands on the bar, eyes fixed on the TV, where only a dense layer of dust and smoke was visible. We're having difficulty seeing the outcome of the battle, said the reporter as the scene remained unknown. After several tense seconds, the dust began to clear. The impact had swept through the entire city center of Osaka, leaving a trail of destruction where Deku unleashed his strike. All the villains were unconscious and scattered in the plane left by the hero's smash. Deku stood in the same place, holding his fist in the air with a smile on his face. Deku has won. He defeated all the villains. Cheered the reporter, and the bar erupted in applause for the young hero who single-handedly took charge and overcame the disadvantageous situation. Ryuko felt a great sense of relief seeing Deku with that bright expression on the screen. It's a relief, she sighed with a smile, breathing easier at seeing him victorious. On more than one occasion, her heart clenched as she watched him endure multiple attacks. She felt frustrated for not being able to be by his side to help, but despite that, she didn't look away. Somehow, she was certain he would win, just like when he defeated Kai Chisaki several years ago. Deku would emerge victorious, even against all odds, and so he did. It was a genuine relief for her to see him safe now. Breaking news. We've just received information that an attack has occurred inside Tartarus prison. Those words grabbed everyone's attention, especially Ryuko, Rumi, and Shinya, who focused on the television where the reporter was speaking. At this moment, Endeavor, Hawks, Kamui Woods, Lemillion, and several heroes are about to arrive at the scene to deal with the situation, said the woman, looking concerned into the camera. The cameraman then zoomed in on Deku, who seemed to have heard something alarming on his communicator. Consequently, he hastily took off, flying at a dizzying speed away from the scene. It's pretty obvious where he's heading. What are you two waiting for? Shinya and Ryuko turned to look at Rumi, who was already at the exit with the door open, smiling defiantly. It's time to be heroes, exclaimed the hero Mirko, receiving nods from her fellow pro heroes. Ryukyu and Edshot, with serious expressions, followed Mirko and left the bar. The three professionals were ready to go to the maximum security prison to provide their necessary support. No matter what, they must prevent the country's most dangerous criminals from escaping, under no circumstances can they allow that to happen. After almost 20 minutes of flight, with Ed shot and Mirko on her back, transformed into a dragon, they arrived at Tartarus facilities. They immediately joined the chaotic battle unfolding under the rain clouds. A large number of villains emerged from the main facility, outnumbered by hundreds of pro-heroes gathered around the prison to fight them. They didn't leave the slightest opportunity for escape, but still, all the prisoners fought desperately for their freedom. With her massive dragon body, she fought against the larger enemies, while Mirko and Edshot joined Red Riot, Fat Gum, Sniper, Grand Orca, Charge Bolt, Cementos, Hound Dog, and Midnight in the confrontation against the most troublesome villains. She understood that inside, Endeavor, Hawks, Lemillion, Ingenium, Bakugo, Shoto, Eraserhead, Present Mike, and many other heroes were successfully containing the prisoners from the first three floors of the underground prison. Fortunately, only the cells on those floors had opened, not the deeper levels where the country's most dangerous villains were truly held. By the time she arrived, the battle seemed to be concluding on the surface. The number of villains in combat noticeably decreased, and the heroes were handling the situation effectively. If everything was going well inside, this incident should end in a few minutes. However, her attention was immediately drawn to the person who fell from the sky and rolled several meters on the ground. In all that chaos, she fixed her gaze on the figure that managed to stand up with difficulty and began walking towards the destroyed main entrance of the prison. Deku, surprise leaked into the hero's voice as she saw the green-haired hero injured and tired, limping toward the entrance. Did he really fly from Osaka to here? Despite seeing it with her own eyes, it was something she found hard to believe. But there he was, 
walking with difficulty as several villains ran furiously towards him to attack. He rightly delivered punches that left the villains incapacitated. A group of five inmates lunged at Deku, who wrapped them with his black whips and threw them back into the prison. It's worth mentioning that several professionals who noticed his presence were also surprised to see him there. Concern and anguish grew exponentially within her. Deku, Ryuko shouted, reverting to her human form as she ran towards the green-haired hero, who didn't stop and kept moving towards the prison entrance. Stop, she exclaimed, reaching him when he stumbled, holding him in time to prevent him from falling. If he already had a difficult battle in Osaka and his wounds were still fresh, he seemed quite tired. Something she understood well considering he literally flew without rest, crossing several prefectures. Seeing him so weak and injured is something she doesn't like, honestly not understanding what the heck this guy was thinking coming to fight in this condition. The green-haired hero lifted his head to see the woman beside him. Our Ryukyu-san, said Izuku with one eye half closed due to the trail of blood descending from his forehead. She smiled gently in an attempt to reassure him. Rest. The situation down there is under control with Endeavor and the others. You have to go to the paramedics to get checked, Ryuko said genuinely concerned about his health. There was no need for him to keep fighting, not after what he did in Osaka. Now it was time for others to do their job as heroes. No. I can't. I have to go in, he insisted, struggling to stand, briefly complaining about the throbbing pain in his body but managing to straighten up. But Ryukyu wouldn't let him go so easily. Give me one reason to let you go, she said sternly, holding his left arm to prevent him from moving forward. As a hero and a colleague, she couldn't let Deku hurt himself more than he already was. Letting him in under these conditions would be negligent on her part. Then Izuku turned to look at her over his shoulder. I have a bad feeling, he said with a serious look as one for all began to surround his body, increasing the adrenaline that would numb his pain and help him move his tired body after using float for too long. The blonde woman noticed the determination in his eyes. He was determined to enter, no matter how much she tried to stop him. Even so. She looked away, unconvinced about letting him go, fearing that if she did, it might be the last time she saw him alive. That's how this job works. Letting him enter a prison with dangerous villains in this condition would almost ensure his death. Deku placed a hand on Ryukyu's shoulder, who turned to look at the green-haired hero, who was smiling at her. This is not how I wanted us to reunite, Ryukyu-san, said Izuku warmly, causing the heroine to lose her words. I'll be back, he assured with conviction and then began walking towards the entrance of Tartarus. Ryuko released his arm and watched bewildered as he walked away with his back turned. Despite being injured, Deku completely overcame anyone who stood in his way and entered the facility, disappearing from the view of the heroine who couldn't take her eyes off him, unable to shake off the unease in her chest telling her to go with him. Ryukyu, help us carry the wounded, shouted ectoplasm from the background, grabbing the dragon heroine's attention. She resigned herself and, with a firm expression, transformed into a dragon. Her role in this operation is to stay up here, provide support in defeating the larger enemies, and transport the injured heroes on her back to the other side of the bridge where paramedics and ambulances were waiting. In this situation, all she can do is pray that Deku is alive when all this is over. She can only trust him. The uprising in Tartarus was a quite serious event that could have had very detrimental consequences for the country if not acted upon in time. It has been two days since it happened, but there were still many things to deal with after that incident. In total, 56 professional heroes were injured, of which only 12 suffered severe damage and have since been receiving intensive care in hospitals. There were also a total of 15 confirmed villain casualties due to the structural damage they caused themselves. After a short investigation and interrogating certain witnesses, it was discovered that everything was orchestrated by a follower of All for One. He organized the numerous group of villains in Osaka to spread destruction and distract the heroes while he infiltrated Tartarus to open the cells of the first three floors, all with the goal of entertaining the professionals on the upper floors while he descended to the last floor to free All for One. That follower of All for One would have succeeded if not for Deku also descending to the depths of the prison and, after a tough fight, managed to incapacitate him. After that, repairs to the prison have been underway, along with various security reforms to prevent such an event from happening again. And, of course, the affected area in Osaka from Deku's battle against the villains has been under reconstruction. Undoubtedly, these past few days have been quite exhausting and strenuous. Just remembering that day is enough to stress her out. Ha! Ryuko sighed with a small smile as she walked through the hospital corridors. Well, regardless of what happened, she's relieved that there were no casualties among heroes or civilians. That's a pretty good outcome considering the severity of what happened in Osaka and Tartarus. And to some extent, 
her relief is because luckily, Deku is fine. She was really worried that day when she saw him lying on a stretcher, being taken into an ambulance. But now, he's conscious and can have visitors. That's why she briefly paused her patrol to deliver a bouquet of white lilies she bought on the way, just a small gesture for his good work. She was almost at the room they told her where Deku was supposed to be resting. Hopefully, they could chat properly, something they couldn't do two days ago. The woman noticed that the door to Deku's room was open, and voices could be heard from inside. So, she walked slowly and peeked in to see a room filled with people around Deku's bed. It was all his class A friends who came in civilian clothes to visit. Stupid Deku. I told you not to fight in the condition you were in, scolded Bakugo, angry, hands in his pockets, getting annoyed just remembering his rival's condition before heading deep into Tartarus. Then Todoroki placed a hand on the ash blonde's shoulder. Calm down, Bakugo. Thanks to Midoriya going down, all for one didn't escape, said Shoto with a calm look. While he didn't agree that his best friend risked his life, it's undeniable that it prevented the disaster that comes with all for one's freedom. Don't worry us like that again, Deku kun, demanded Uraka, the green haired guy resting in bed with bandages around his head and neck, and his right arm in a cast. Still, he could only smile apologetically for worrying his friends. I thought you were crazy when you said you had to reach the top floor, Ida said, adjusting his glasses sternly, catching Izuku's attention. Thanks for helping me with that, Ida kun, the freckled young man, thanked his dark haired friend with a genuine smile, scratching his cheek with his left hand. It was pretty manly what you did in Osaka, Midoriya, exclaimed Kirishima excitedly, clenching his fists. After that, the room filled with comments from the other visitors of the green-haired guy, who listened with a smile. She smiled slightly as she stopped spying and silently walked away from the noisy, lively room. It seems her visit wasn't necessary, Deku is well enough to enjoy the company of friends who care about him. To be honest, she was a bit naive to think someone like him wouldn't have many visitors but it's fine if she can't talk to him yet because, in the end, Deku is smiling. Still, she wishes she could have at least delivered the flowers in person. Excuse me, Ryuko called a passing nurse. What do you need, Ryukyu? The nurse asked politely with a small smile to the dragon heroine. Can you deliver these flowers to Deku for me? I have work to do, the professional asked the woman kindly, who accepted the bouquet of lilies and nodded. Sure, I'll make sure he gets them. The nurse responded with a sweet smile before walking towards Deku's hero room, relieving Ryuko of a burden as she headed towards the hospital exit without looking back. It's strange, even though she knows the flowers will be delivered to Deku, that uneasiness in her chest doesn't disappear. On the contrary, it gets stronger, as if she's neglecting something important she needs to do. She really wishes she could understand this complex feeling she only feels when thinking about Deku. It's been a week since the uprising in Tartarus, and since then, things have been slowly returning to normal. No other major incident has occurred, which is good news for her, as she values the rare moments of peace that come her way. After all, her profession is not exactly the safest and most relaxing. For example, she has been locked in her office all morning with paperwork from the last week of her agency's work. There were reports of incidents handled by the hired heroes, proposed changes in patrol routes, financial records, efficiency analyses of each professional in her agency, crime rates in the area and a long list of documents to review and approve. She never thought founding a hero agency would be so complicated. While she has been getting used to carrying all this responsibility over the years, she would prefer a thousand times to go back to being an independent hero, like when she made her professional debut. Perhaps that way, she would have more chances of running into. Excuse me, Miss Ryukyu, there's someone who wants to talk to you, her secretary said through the landline on her desk, pulling her out of her thoughts. The woman pressed the red button to communicate. Who is it? She asked calmly, as she didn't expect anyone today, and certainly not a government official inspection. Ryu Chan. It's me, the energetic and cheerful voice on the other end was unmistakable to Ryuko, who smiled as she pressed the button again. Let her in, she told her secretary, then leaned back in her chair, allowing herself a brief break to chat with the girl she almost saw as a little sister, a curious and enthusiastic younger sister. Nay Hire didn't take long to enter Ryuko's office with a radiant smile. Long time no see, Ryu-chan. Greeted the blue-haired girl with a lot of energy, entering the office with one hand behind her back, and using the other to greet the blonde heroine. Ryuko covered her faint laugh with her hand. What are you talking about, Nay Hire? We saw each other on the Nagoya Bridge after what happened in Tartarus, the woman said, amused by the young woman who was once a resident in her agency. 
seven days is quite a long time, don't you think? said Nahire, intertwining her hands behind her back and tilting her head a little. Well, that depends. She's used to regularly meeting Nahire, so there's no need to miss her. Although it's true that her presence has been missed in the agency since she debuted as an independent hero a year ago. But in the case of another hero, for some reason, she has a constant need to see him and talk about anything. In her case, not being able to chat with him for two weeks has been a nagging annoyance she can't shake off. Maybe, she vaguely responded. What brings you here? Ryuko asked with a small smile to the blue-haired girl, who approached to take a seat in front of the desk, being careful to hide what she had behind her back. I came to say hi, of course. At least, that's my main reason. Are you surprised? Nehire said, smiling with a noticeable hint of curiosity, which amused the calm woman who crossed her arms in her seat. It sounds very much like you. You know you could have called, right? Ryuko said, looking serenely at Nehire, who has had her personal number since her time as a resident. That's why I present my second reason for coming to see you. Nehire responded cheerfully, showing a flower she had been hiding behind her back since she arrived. Ryuko's eyes opened slightly. A lily? She asked, confused. The flower Nehire is holding is the same white color as the one she sent to Deku in the hospital. It's from Izuku-kun, was what the blue-haired girl said, causing a wave of surprise in Ryuko, who then felt. Annoyed? Nehire, oblivious to Ryuko's feelings, smiled delightedly with the lily in her hand. He gave it to me yesterday as a thank you for helping him get out of Tartarus when it all ended. Isn't it cute? I followed him to the top floor out of curiosity, and I was surprised when I found him standing on the mastermind of the attack. I was really worried, you know? Besides, it was hard to carry him, the beautiful blue-haired girl said with a radiant expression and a faint blush. Ryuko, beneath her calm demeanor, had an inexplicable anger growing inside her. Why? She wouldn't know how to put it into words, let alone find meaning. Simply put, she's a bit annoyed, maybe because Nehire was so happy about a flower that she probably gave to Deku, or maybe because. No, that's not possible, there's no way that's it. Did you just come to tell me this? Ryuko asked with a stiff smile, as even though it may not be Nehire's intention, it seems like she's showing off. I haven't finished yet. When I talked to Deku-kun, he told me to give you a message when I saw you, Nehire said with a smile, instantly calming all of Ryuko's anger, replaced by genuine interest. The woman raised an eyebrow slightly. And what is it? She asked calmly to the blue-haired girl, who put a finger on her chin as she recalled. Even though I didn't do much, thanks for the flowers, Ryukyu-san, I think that's what he said, Nehire replied absentmindedly, stating the words of the green-haired guy, causing Ryuko to widen her eyes slightly. Strange, right? It would have been better if he had written to you by phone. Does he have your number? If not, he could have asked me, right? Nehire said sincerely intrigued, focusing her attention on the woman behind the desk, who had the back of her hand against her mouth. Ryu-chan? She called, confused, to the heroine who didn't answer. A sweet laugh came from Ryuko, bewildering Nehire, who was surprised to see her laughing with a faint blush on her cheeks. Did she say something? Ryuko's laughter didn't take long to subside, and the woman wiped a tear from the edge of her eye. He really is a peculiar guy, she said to herself with an inexplicable happiness inside after hearing Deku's message. To think that even after everything he did that day, he doesn't consider himself worthy of a simple flower. She doesn't know if to call that modesty or stupidity. Either way, that's Izuku Midoriya, right? She could only feel grateful for knowing such a curious hero. Can I give him a message for you when I see him? Nehire asked smiling at Ryukyu, who nodded and leaned forward on her desk, resting her arms on it while a charming smile appeared on her face. You did a good job, be proud, was her message to Deku, which disappointed Nehire a bit, causing her to raise an eyebrow. Isn't that too formal? I'd like a response with more emotion, the blue-haired girl expressed her view calmly, receiving only a denial from the calm woman who leaned back in her chair again. I think that's enough to recognize his effort and performance as a hero, Ryuko replied with a faint smile. While there were many things she wanted to tell him, there's no way in the world she'd use Nehire as a messenger, especially considering the blue-haired girl seems to have some affection for the guy. Nehire didn't dwell on it and shrugged. Got it. I'll go tell him right away, exclaimed the cheerful blue-haired girl, startling Ryuko a bit. D don't rush. When you see him, you can give him the message. You don't have to go now, Ryukyu told Nehire with a small, nervous smile, extending her hand to stop Nehire. She doesn't want to seem desperate to send Nehire to Deku's house just to give him a response. 
Nei Hire Chan turned to look at Ryuko over her shoulder. Don't you know? I'm going to the apartment we're sharing, she said casually, taking the heroine by surprise, slightly widening her eyes. You guys live. Together? Ryuko asked, still processing what Nei Hire just said. The cheerful young girl nodded. Sort of. A couple of months ago, I asked him for help to pay the rent for my apartment. It seems the landlady charges less to couples, so I asked him to pretend to be my boyfriend until I had the money to move somewhere else, Nehire explained innocently, clasping her hands to hold the flower that the green-haired guy gave her. The explanation helped to ease Ryuko's discomfort. She felt strangely relieved to understand that the context wasn't romantic. Certainly, the idea of Nehire and Deku living together is still compromising, but knowing that it was the green-haired guy who generously agreed to help, it simply isn't something she could blame her for. That's very kind of him, but, why didn't you ask Sun Eater? Isn't he your friend? Ryuko asked, looking calmly at Nehire, who immediately shook her hand in denial. Tamaki has the heart of a flea, he wouldn't stand it, Nehire replied neutrally, knowing well the introverted friend with serious self-esteem issues. And Lemillion? The woman asked, crossing her arms at her desk. I don't think his girlfriend would have agreed, the young blue-haired girl replied with a finger on her chin. Ryuko furrowed her brow a bit and closed her eyes. In a way, she understands why Nehire turned to Deku for help with her problem, but again, it's not something she feels comfortable with. Why? There doesn't have to be a specific reason, right? It just happens that, for some reason, she feels like something has been silently taken away from her, and now is when she realizes it. Nehire, on her side, looked at Ryukyu oddly. It seems that something is bothering her. After all, she has worked for her for several years, and on this occasion, she can assure that Ryu Chan is reflecting on something that troubles her. And? What's it like? Ryuko asked suddenly after almost a minute of silence. What's like? Nehire asked back, confused, raising an eyebrow. The blonde heroine turned her head, and a faint blush appeared on her cheeks. Living with Deku, Ryuko specified, timidly glancing at Nehire. Oh, that. It's really nice. He's very good at cooking and is skilled with household chores, the cheerful young girl said happily, holding the white lily she picked up against her chest. Ryukyu noticed that Nehire didn't seem to have more to say about it. Is that all? She asked, looking at her intently, obviously interested in knowing more since Nehire didn't satisfy her curiosity. But the blue-haired girl weakly nodded. Not everything, but unfortunately, we haven't spent much time together recently. Deku Kun almost always comes back in the early morning from his patrol and leaves early in the morning after going out to train. Rare are the occasions when I taste his food these last few days, she explained, making a cute pout. I see, was all Ryuko said about it, holding her chin with one hand. Then Nehire doesn't spend as much time with Deku as she thought. That's good, quite good. She felt like a great weight was lifted off her after acquiring this information. Of course, it's not that it made her happy although the small smile on her face says otherwise. Are you interested in him? Nehire asked with an innocent smile to the woman, who calmly shook her head. Ryuko clarified, both to Nehire and herself, that she was just curious. She emphasized that her interest in Deku was strictly professional. It seemed implausible for her to be romantically interested in a boy several years younger than her. Not at all, Nehire responded skeptically to Ryuko's explanation. All right then, I've got to go, Nehire exclaimed, regaining her usual energy as she headed towards the door. I'll pass your message to Izuku-kun when I see him. I'll call you later and let you know how he reacts. Sound good? Nehire asked with a wide smile. That's not necessary, Nehire, really, Ryuko said with a small smile, but her words fell on deaf ears. Then I'll do it. See you, Nehire-chan cheerfully bid farewell before leaving Ryuko's office, leaving her alone again in the privacy of her workspace. Ryuko allowed herself to release a long sigh. Dealing with Nehire was never boring, the girl was a true free spirit. Perhaps that's why she and Mirko became so close when she introduced them, both living life on their own terms. In conclusion, no matter how much time passed since she met Nehire, Nehire remained Nehire. Maybe that's why Ryuko grew so fond of her. Another reason why she couldn't be interested in Deku, he's the boy her little sister cares so much about. A week flew by for her, her daily life usually held nothing special, just her routine of going to work and returning home to rest, only to repeat the process the next day. She wasn't dissatisfied with her way of life, she enjoyed being a hero and was on good terms with everything it entailed. But, perhaps something was missing. Anyway, it wasn't like her to ramble. For now, 
her goal was to find a place to have lunch, as her break had just started, and she couldn't afford to waste it wandering aimlessly. If only she hadn't forgotten her phone in her office, then she could locate a place online. She greeted a few civilians who stopped her to express their admiration and continued her journey to find a place to eat. It's not easy walking down the street in her hero costume, people recognize her much more easily. ARF, a cute bark caught Ryuko's attention. She looked down to see a little Shiba Inu running towards her. The puppy stopped at her feet, tongue out, and its tail wagging energetically. The adorable animal brought a small smile to the hero's face, softening her expression. Hello, little one, she greeted the Shiba Inu kindly, and it barked happily, shaking its tail even more. Pokey, a male voice approached hurriedly from the distance. Ryuko looked up to see the presumably owner of this cute dog. Deku? Ryuko asked, surprised to see the green-haired young man in civilian clothes, who seemed equally surprised by their encounter. ARF ARF, the little canine barked joyfully, walking towards Izuku, who knelt down to cradle the puppy delicately. He, however, never took his eyes off the woman in front of him. Oh, a Ryukyu-san, good to see you again, greeted the young man nervously with a smile and a slight blush on his cheeks. She made a minimal effort to control her own surprise and responded politely. Likewise. Is this puppy yours? She asked with a small smile to the green-haired guy, who was still petting Pokey. Sort of. Nehire found him a few days ago, and we've been looking for him a home since then. We can't have pets in our apartment, Izuku replied calmly, looking at the woman while the puppy continued to wag its tail, enjoying Deku's caress. Ryukyu's expression hardened slightly as she remembered that detail. Right, you two live together. For some reason, even seven days later, she still doesn't feel comfortable with the idea of them sharing a roof. Izuku's freckled cheeks turned intensely rosy, and his eyes widened. It's not what you're thinking, Ryukyu-san. Nehir and I don't have that kind of relationship, the young man clarified hastily, wanting to dispel any possible misunderstanding caused by revealing that he's living with a lovely girl like Nehir. She smiled faintly to try to calm his agitation. I know, she filled me in on the details, Ryuko replied, successfully soothing Izuku, who sighed in relief. She trusted Nehire and Deku. If they said they didn't have that kind of relationship and were just sharing an apartment, then that was the truth. Nehire was brutally honest, and honestly, he seemed incapable of lying. There was no reason to doubt their words. The real issue was that she didn't understand why she was so interested in the topic. Why did the idea of them having that kind of relationship irritate her? They were two young adults living under the same roof, it wouldn't be absurd if there was some chemistry between them. Besides, her love life was none of her concern. So why did it bother her? What are you up to, Ryukyu-san? Izuku asked with a small smile, bringing her back from her thoughts as he knelt on the ground. I'm on my break, looking for a good place to eat in this area. Do you know any? Ryuko asked calmly expecting Izuku to know of a nearby place where she could finally have lunch. He blushed slightly, hand on the back of his neck. I if you like, you can have lunch at my place. I'll cook katsudon, Izuku kindly offered with a smile on his face. The proposal caught the woman off guard, making her feel a bit disoriented. I, I don't want to be a bother, she replied, unsure if it was really okay to accept. Izuku stood up with Pokey in his arms. It's no trouble, Ryukyu-san. I insist, generously insisted the curly-haired young man, an expression that made it quite difficult to say no. He's really good at cooking, Nehire had said that once, sparking her curiosity. Moreover, he was insisting, and it would be impolite to decline. I guess I'll accept your offer, Ryuko agreed, closing her eyes with a small smile on her lips as she crossed her arms. The green-haired guy and the dog were happy with her response. Great, Nehire and I live two blocks from here. Follow me, Izuku said with a smile, then walked towards his apartment, Ryuko following. She had a faint blush on her cheeks. She followed him simply because it would be rude to reject his kind offer. So why was her heart beating a little faster? They soon arrived at the apartment shared by Izuku and Nehire. At first glance, it was entirely average, no one would think that Deku and Nehire chan were living in a simple residential condominium. Once they took the elevator to the third floor, Izuku led the heroine to the back door of the hallway, where he inserted his key to open it. He then placed Pokey on the floor. ARF ARF, the energetic little Shiba Inu ran into the home, leaving Izuku and Ryuko at the entrance. Izuku stepped aside for the woman to pass. F feel at home, he said, smiling a bit nervously, a faint blush on his cheeks. 
Ryukyu managed to conceal her own anxiety and cross the threshold. Excuse me, she said calmly, walking down the hallway while Deku closed the door behind her. At first glance, there was nothing outstanding. It was just a completely average apartment in every aspect, two rooms, one bathroom, and a kitchen connected to the living room. Even the furniture was not very luxurious but not unpleasant to the eye. To think that both Nehire and the green-haired guy were living humbly in this place despite their income as famous professionals. In a way, she envied them. It was as if they were simulating the life of a young couple in love. Friends, they're friends, not lovers. Speaking of Nehire, the place is quite peaceful. Nehire isn't around? Ryuko asked Izuku, a bit curious, as he entered the living room from the hallway. She got called for an operation in Oita, she won't be back until tonight, the young man replied with a small smile, continuing his way to the kitchen, leaving the blonde woman a bit uneasy. Is it really okay for her to be at Deku's place when Nehire isn't there? I mean, they're completely alone, excluding Pokey, so this could lead to some misunderstandings. No, nothing will happen. There's no attraction between them. She's just accepting the lunch the young pro hero offered, nothing more. She took a seat on the only sofa in the living room, keeping an eye on Izuku, who entered the kitchen and opened a cupboard, taking out a bag of dog food. The young man knelt down next to two small containers on the floor, one empty and the other filled with water, presumably belonging to the house's little puppy. Without Nehire, I guess it's your turn to take care of. Pokey, right? Ryuko said with a gentle smile, looking at the puppy while Izuku served food into the container. ARF, the little pokey barked, running adorable towards the food bowl. Izuku smiled amusingly, patting the back of the voracious and cute puppy. Yeah, I'm not here much, so it was my turn to take care of him for the day, he replied to Ryuko, turning to look at her. Do you want tea or coffee? He asked, standing up to put away the dog food bag. Tea, please, Ryuko responded calmly from the sofa, watching as Deku placed the teapot on the stove and proceeded to prepare the ingredients he would use for lunch after washing his hands. There's a comforting feeling just watching him. She couldn't explain it, but there's a certain warmth in this humble apartment that makes her feel comfortable and relaxed, especially considering the presence of the kind young man who generously invited her for lunch. If she had to describe this feeling, it would be like being right where she belongs. Ryuko shook her head to rid herself of unnecessary thoughts. How's it going with finding a home for Pokey? She asked Deku calmly, just making conversation while she focused her gaze on the little dog still eating from his bowl. Deku started chopping vegetables skillfully. We've put up some posters in the area and called several of our friends. For now, we don't have anything secured, but Kirishima-kun. Red Riot said he was interested in adopting him, he said with a small smile, not taking his eyes off his knife, using Kirishima's hero name for Ryuko to easily identify him. The heroine smiled gently. It's very noble what you two want to do for this puppy, Ryuko remarked, touched by Nehire and Deku's intentions to find a home for little Pokey. Selfless acts like these reaffirm her belief that both of them have big hearts. Surely that's why you're so popular with the ladies, don't you think? She added, teasing Deku a bit. The boy blushed faintly, unable to find a way to respond to that comment. He just continued cooking, and for two minutes, there was a cozy silence between him and the woman. Once Pokey finished eating, he ran towards Ryuko's legs. Touched, she lifted and sat him beside her to pamper him. It was then that Izuku came out of the kitchen with two tea cups in his hands and placed one on the table in front of Ryuko. H here you go, he said kindly, receiving a thank you from the heroine, who subtly blew on her tea and then took a sip. The green-haired guy watched Ryuko drink tea for a moment and how she petted Pokey, who was peacefully resting at her side. The scene itself brought a small smile to the freckled young man's face as he decided to share a bit of himself. I always liked dogs since I was a kid, but I could never have one. I'd like to take care of one someday, but I'm always working. So, the most I can do for Pokey is to find him a family that will love him, said Izuku gently with a captivating expression, affecting Ryuko, who felt her face starting to warm, and not because of the tea. Well, if you like, you can turn on the TV. I won't take long, nervously said the boy, returning to the kitchen, thinking he had just said something embarrassing. It took a few seconds for the woman to control herself and regain composure. She didn't know if he said something so nice by accident or not. Either way, making those kinds of comments with that expression is quite dangerous. If Nehire has to deal with this almost daily, then it's hard for Ryuko to believe that he hasn't really done something to the green-haired guy. The hero slowly turned to look at the young man cooking with a faint blush on his cheeks, quite adorable, really. Take your time, Deku. 
my break ends in more than an hour, said Ryuko, entertained without the need for a TV, just by looking at him. Besides, this little one will keep me company, right? She added with a small smile, looking down at Pokey. Arf! barked the cute Shiba Inu puppy in response, tongue out. Was the name Nehire's idea? Ryukyu asked the green-haired guy in the kitchen, who smiled a bit embarrassed. Actually, it was mine. She wanted to name him Francis Bartholomew Pretzel Nugget, Izuku replied with a beat of sweat on his temple, eliciting a sweet and charming laugh from Ryuko that was like music to her ears. Fufufu. I like Pokey better, the beautiful hero opined with a lovely smile and a faint blush on her cheeks, her gaze fixed on the young man with green eyes who looked away embarrassed. She did her best to contain her amusement at the cute reaction of the boy. Thinking that she, with her calm and reserved personality, could enjoy teasing Deku a bit is honestly something she probably wouldn't get tired of. Once her hero work for the day was done, she flew back to her apartment and has since not moved from the luxurious sofa in her living room. She's not doing anything specific, just lost in her thoughts while staring into space with a dull expression. Why is she like this? Well, to know that, you have to know another thing about Ryuko Tatsuma. Before making dinner, she takes some time to analyze the events that happened throughout the day. The morning was quite simple, greeting civilians, signing some autographs, stopping a purse snatcher, and continuing patrolling until her break. That's when her problem surfaces. She forgot everything that happened when she resumed patrolling in the afternoon. Seriously, she remembers in detail everything that happened from finding Deku in the middle of the street to the moment he bid her farewell from his apartment with a kind smile. But then, she doesn't remember anything at all. Before she knew it, she was already heading home after finishing her work for the day. What's happening to me? She wondered, truly unaware of what's going on. It's as if the most important event of her day was meeting Deku and having lunch at his place, and everything else lost all relevance to the point where she didn't even bother to remember it. Although, how could she not give it importance? Honestly, that was the most enjoyable break she's had in a long time. Someone welcoming her into their home and preparing a delicious meal, which she can still taste, enjoying a good conversation with a pleasant person, and feeling comfortable in such a homey atmosphere, it was an oasis in the monotonous routine of her everyday life. But undoubtedly, what she can highlight the most is the satisfaction of having a long and meaningful conversation with Deku. It doesn't have to have a deep meaning, they simply managed to talk to each other properly without villains threatening to escape from prison or anything like that. She could chat with Izuku Midoriya, and she can admit without any issues that she likes his company. As ridiculous as it sounds, she felt more comfortable and lively in his presence than in the privacy of her silent home. And while that's not normal for her, she wouldn't complain when she actually had a good time. Still, it's curious. Why does she sympathize so much with the green-haired guy? It's true that he's an admirable hero, a thoughtful and sweet young man with a big heart, and, not to mention, quite handsome. But even with all that, those aren't reasons that could justify that something that makes her think of him in a way she can't explain in words. Obviously, she must discard the option of seeing him as a romantic interest because it's impossible for her to be attracted to a guy several years younger than her, adding the fact that Nehire probably feels something for him. If she, just by spending a little over an hour with Deku, felt her heart race a few times, Nehire, who lives with him, must be at least interested in establishing a relationship. A sigh escaped her lips. Not knowing why she thinks so much about the young hero is somewhat stressful for her, although she won't torment herself with it when she can continue with her life, and eventually, the answer will come to her. When she was about to get up to make her dinner, the woman received a message on her phone next to her. Ryuko took her phone and read the message that had just arrived, which, to her surprise, was from Nehire. Izuku-kun told me you dropped by for lunch. That means you've met Pokey. Look at a few photos I took, he's quite cute. Several photos were then sent to her, all presumably of the Shiba Inu puppy taken from Nehire's phone. In one, Pokey was eating, in another, he was lying on Nehire's lap on the sofa while she smiled at the camera, in another, Pokey was lying on his back, getting his belly rubbed, and finally, Ryuko observed the last photo. In this one, Pokey was sleeping on the chest of an equally sleeping Izuku. The photo was taken from the opening of the green-haired guy's room, and the light was off, but the image was still clear enough. Something inside Ryuko stirred as she saw Deku's face sleeping so peacefully with the adorable puppy on his chest. Cute, she thought, touched with blushed cheeks and a charming smile as she stared at what would be her favorite photo. In a good mood out of nowhere, she locked her phone and got up from the sofa to go to her kitchen. Maybe she doesn't care to remember what happened in the second half of her day, but fatigue persists, 
and she needs to rest properly to go back to work tomorrow. There's a possibility that before going to sleep, she might check that last image again, just to appreciate Pokey sleeping, for no other reason. She sighed warm air over her hands before rubbing them and hugging herself a bit to warm up. She really hoped it would be a somewhat cold night, but not to this extent. If she had known, she would have brought boots instead of sneakers and a long coat instead of a short one. Her only comfort is that she's not far from her destination. The streets are full of life, several shops are open, civilians are strolling carefreely, and cars are moving once the traffic light turns green. Another ordinary night in one of the busy areas of Tokyo. With so many people around, hardly anyone would pay attention to her, and therefore, they wouldn't recognize her. Frankly, she hoped to be just Ryuko tonight, despite enjoying interacting with a fan. That's why she dressed casually and nothing too flashy, just blue pants, a red blouse, a short black coat, along with her red sneakers and spike earrings. Dress like a civilian, heading to a pub like any other citizen. This is one of those nights when she can take off the Ryukyu hero mantle and relax in the company of her friends who invited her for a drink. It didn't take long to spot the venue after turning a corner. After crossing the street and a brief greeting to the bouncer, she entered the establishment. The sound of music, previously drowned out by the city's hustle and bustle, became clearer and louder. She didn't really dislike the atmosphere of the place as she ventured further, already familiar with the way. After just over a couple of minutes, she reached the main lobby, where she quickly spotted two lively individuals sitting at the bar. She's here, exclaimed Rumi energetically, raising a beer mug when she saw her. Over here, Ryu Chan, Nehire exclaimed, equally cheerful and noisy, waving her hand as if the blonde couldn't see them with the noise they were making. She sighed with a faint smile, shaking her head, and approached them. It shouldn't surprise her that they've already started drinking without her. Lower your voices, don't make a fuss, Ryuko told them in an attempt to scold them sternly, but it wasn't convincing when she herself seemed amused with a hand on her waist. We knew you were coming, Rumi said, smirking, before taking a deep swig of her beer and then sighing in satisfaction. I needed a break after drafting reports on the incidents resolved these past few days. Seriously, criminals cause problems in more than one sense, she said, a bit tired, bringing a hand to her head to massage her temple. The damn paperwork remains a nuisance she can't get used to, even after years of doing it. Nehair took a martini from the bar that she had ordered earlier and handed it to Ryuko. That's why you're here, Ryu-chan, to relax, she assured the woman, whom she considers an older sister. Ryuko looked at the martini in her hand before looking back at the two of them. You're not going to get me drunk, she told them sternly, warning them not to try to help her relax with alcohol. She wouldn't come out of that well. Rumi laughed amusingly after her comment. We'd never do that, right, Hado-chan? She turned with a smile to the younger woman next to her. Never, Nehire responded, equally smiling, to the rabbit-like woman. Ryuko could only sigh quietly before bringing the glass to her lips and taking a small sip of her drink. Seriously, they are a case she couldn't deal with without a few drinks. Hey! A cheerful call drew the attention of the four young women who turned to see Mirio waving from the entrance. We're here, he said, and alongside him, Tamaki and Shinya approached, all three dressed casually. While she was surprised to see them here, her eyes widened slightly when she caught sight of Izuku following them a few steps behind. It would be hard not to see him considering his height and the attention he naturally draws to himself. Dark boots, tight blue pants, a white shirt rolled up to the elbows that clung to his toned torso and highlighted his muscular forearms, with a few buttons undone and his tousled curls gave him a rebellious air that contrasted with the shy and cute smile on his face. Damn, if he really sets his mind to it, he can be a chick magnet. She really can't understand why he doesn't have a partner with how handsome he is. She would say she hasn't seen him since two weeks ago when she went to his apartment, but that would be partially a lie considering a certain image in her phone gallery. Rumi leaned her arm on her shoulder. We also invited Lamillion, Sun Eater, the weakling, and Deku to join us, she said with a playful smile, glancing at Ryuko from the corner of her eye, who remained calm despite the faint pink on her cheeks indicating otherwise. Greetings, Edge Shot said to Ryuko once they joined them, and the others greeted Nehire and Rumi. It seems you're getting used to hanging out with Rumi, aren't you? Ryuko commented with a hint of teasing to the man who furrowed his brow slightly. I only came to hang out with colleagues, that woman has nothing to do with. Damn it, the grey-haired man replied with noticeable weariness once the rabbit-like woman showed that shit-eating grin she always has when she's about to annoy him. Thank you for inviting us, Nehire san Mirio enthusiastically thanked his blue-haired friend, who waved it off with a casual gesture. 
I knew only you could bring Tamaki. Well done. Nehire congratulated, giving a thumbs up to the blonde who hugged his best friend around the neck. Sorry, Tamaki apologized shyly, covering his face with a strand of hair. Mirio and Nehire found it amusing, knowing he hadn't changed much since Yue. Unaware of these interactions, Ryuko and Izuku stood a bit apart, exchanging awkward glances. Ryuko smiled courteously, while the green-haired boy scratched his head clumsily. H. Hi, Ryukyu-san, Izuku greeted, smiling nervously, amusing Ryuko, who found it funny how his personality contrasted with his handsome appearance. When we're not working, you don't have to call me that, Midoriya, she said with a slight smile, not liking that, as Ryuko, he addressed her by her hero name. He looked a bit surprised before scratching his cheek with a finger, lowering his gaze. T. Tatsuma-san, he said, visibly embarrassed, much to Ryuko's amusement. That's better, Ryuko affirmed, satisfied, before her attention turned to Rumi, who was pulling her arm. How about we sit in a more comfortable place? The rabbit woman suggested with a wide smile, pointing to a vacant table in the back. I support that idea, Mirio agreed without any problem, followed by Tamaki and Shinya. Nehire approached Izuku and took his arm. Come on, Deku-kun. She cheerfully said, pulling the taller boy, who awkwardly followed. Seeing this, Ryuko felt a pang in her chest. What's wrong, Tatsuma? Edgeshot asked the woman, who seemed concerned about something once she stopped. She smiled gently before shaking her head. Nothing, just got distracted, she replied before taking a deeper sip of her martini and then heading towards the table where her little sister was already sitting next to Midoriya. An hour later, more people were in the venue, and the music had increased just enough for the heroes at the back table to continue chatting and drinking without having to raise their voices. After much conversation, the atmosphere became more jovial and informal, partly due to the drinks everyone had been having during their discussions on various topics. Jokes were made, occasional laughter erupted after a funny story, and everyone felt at ease. Edge shot, after a sip of the beer Rumi forced him to order, turned to Tamaki, Mirio, and Izuku. I'm curious, why did they derail that train two months ago? He asked, sparking interest at the women at the table. You mean when villains hijacked a Shinkansen train? I'm curious too, Ryuko said with the same interest before looking at Izuku sitting beside her. Do I tell it, or do you, Midori Yakun? Mirio asked with a smile, prompting the green-haired boy, who had just taken a sip of his beer, to respond calmly. I think Mirio-san would explain it better, he replied, looking at the blonde who eagerly began to tell the story. All right, let's start with a question, Mirio said animatedly, leaning forward with his elbows on the table. What matters more, the train or the passengers? He asked, lifting a finger. I know, Nehire exclaimed, raising her hand like a child asking for permission to speak in class, amusing both Izuku and Ryuko. Hmm. Nehire san Mirio pointed to the blue-haired girl, who clapped excitedly before confidently answering, the passengers. Exactly. That's why Tamaki, Midoriya, and I had to figure out how to save the passengers on a brakeless train going 420 km per hour, the blonde, also known as Lamillion, said a bit more seriously without losing his smile. We had less than five minutes to reach the station in Hokkaido, where the police had formed barricades to stop the train abruptly. It would have derailed on the curve, causing a lot of destruction. Since the hijackers destroyed the brakes, we had only two possible alternatives. The first one was to evacuate the passengers from the train, he recounted, recalling the incident as others listened. But at that speed, it's almost impossible, Shinya said skeptically, doubtful that such a feat could be achieved. Not to mention the number of people to evacuate in such a short time, Ryuko added, expressing doubt given the extreme situation they faced. That's why it's best to stop the stupid train, Rumi roared bravely, banging her jug on the table. Exactly. Mirio responded, then continued, I grouped them in the last carriage, Tamaki secured them all with his tentacles against a wall to minimize damage once the train shook. Then, Midori Yakun positioned himself on the train tracks to stop it, causing the bullet train to bend in half and overturn when it reached the station. Some carriages would have fallen off if he hadn't held them with his black whips, the blonde explained with a smile, and all eyes turned to the freckled guy at the table. That requires quite a bit of strength, Edgeshot commented with a trace of astonishment and surprise on his face, though he should have expected it from Deku, who continually achieves such feats. Nehire made Izuku raise and flex his arm, much to his embarrassment. Deku-kun is stronger than Mirio-san, even though Mirio-san has more muscles. How strange, the blue-haired girl said curiously, 
eliciting a laugh from Lemillion, who also flexed his arm. Midori Akun surpasses me completely, Mirio said, amused, looking at the green-haired boy who could, with one arm, lift an entire collapsing building, which had actually happened. Izuku scratched the back of his head a bit embarrassedly. It's just because of my quirk, he said modestly, explaining that it's due to one for all, combined with the quirks of the previous holders, that he can do what he does, saving people. Thanks to Midori Akun's black whips, no carriage fell off the tracks, and thanks to Tamaki, there weren't many injuries among the passengers. You guys did great. The muscular blonde praised them with a wide and cheerful smile before clinking glasses with Mirko and both taking a deep sip of their drink. Tamaki lifted his gaze a bit. You too, Mirio. You used your quirk to incapacitate all the villains inside and organized people as you passed through the carriages so they wouldn't panic, the shy and quiet black-haired boy said more clearly and confidently than before. That's right, Mirio-san, you looked pretty amazing, Izuku said with a sincere smile to his senpai, from whom he continues to learn a lot on the few occasions they work together. You flatter me. So, did the three of us play our roles well, right? Mirio responded happily, hugging Tamaki's neck beside him and rising a bit to mess up Izuku's hair, who laughed softly at his friend's antics. Ryuko and Nehire smiled gently as they watched the interaction between the three of them. They felt especially happy for Izuku, who seemed to be having a good time and relaxing after all the hard work he does as an independent hero. Hey, Deku, the mentioned one turned to look at Rumi, who had finished another jug of beer. How did you know that villain who orchestrated the Tartarus escape was going after all for one? The white-haired woman asked the boy, raising an eyebrow. That's right, Deku-kun. How did you know? Nehire turned to her friend with innocent curiosity and interest, as he hadn't touched on the topic before. Izuku seemed a bit conflicted in responding and this didn't go unnoticed by the dragon hero. She placed a hand gently on his shoulder. We don't have to talk about it now if you don't want to, Ryuko told him understandingly, so he wouldn't feel obliged to say it. He smiled a bit and shook his head slowly. No, it's okay, he replied before looking up to see the rest of the table members. When I was in Osaka, and the battle ended, I had a feeling that it didn't make sense. Why attack deliberately without apparent reason? Something didn't add up, and it was bothering me, he recounted as his gaze hardened. That's when I received the news that the prisoners from the first three floors of Tartarus had escaped, and the professionals needed reinforcements. Something inside me screamed that something dangerous was about to happen. I knew that all for one would benefit from that chaos in some way to escape. Izuku tried to explain the best he could, hiding all the details about his special connection with all for one and how it was thanks to this that he could prevent several disasters when Tomura Shigaraki acquired the original quirk, and they faced each other repeatedly. A wild grin spread across Mirko's face. So, you raced across prefectures at top speed without tending to your injuries? Man, we should grab coffee sometime. The rabbit hero exclaimed enthusiastically, a blush tinting her cheeks from the alcohol, causing Ryuko and Nehire to silently disapprove of that suggestion. You did a splendid job preventing all for one from escaping, Midoriya, Shinya praised the young rising hero, crossing his arms. The freckled boy smiled a bit while rubbing the back of his neck. I was only able to do it, thanks to all the heroes who cleared the way for me to the elevator. Without them, I wouldn't have made it in time, he assured, expressing gratitude to all those who had lent him their help during the chaos. Give yourself more credit, Deku-kun, Nehir said radiantly, giving several pats on Izuku's back, who appeared a bit embarrassed. Bring us another round, Rumi shouted with a smile to the nearest waiter, who nodded before heading to the bar. The waiter soon returned with more drinks that each one had been ordering, placing them in front of them before politely retreating to another table. Mirko, without hesitation, took her beer jug and raised it in front of the others. Let's drink, and then let's kick some villain ass, Rumi said with a half-smile and a challenging look. I think that's her way of saying we should relax now to do a better job tomorrow, Edge shot opined with a sigh, reluctantly taking the jug with his hand before raising it as well. I'm up for that, Mirio exclaimed, taking his drink and also raising it. Me too. Nehire said excitedly, also taking hers and doing the same. Tamaki slowly took his bottle in his hands. I'm sorry, I'll try to do a better job, the insecure young man said softly before lifting his drink. You really have the heart of a flea, Tamaki, Nehire teased Sun Eater, who only whispered apologies. Izuku and Ryuko, who were missing, looked at each other, smiled slightly, and took their respective drinks. Then, they raised them to make a toast together with everyone. Mirio and Nehire started chatting animatedly with Rumi, while Shinya and Tamaki remained on the sidelines. 
Ryuko turned to look at the green-haired boy next to her, who seemed to enjoy watching them talk. It seems he found someone else who also lets loose with the troublemakers around and enjoys seeing them have a good time. The freckled boy noticed her gaze and blushed slightly before turning his head a bit, much to the woman's delight. She smiled gently. Well, it's not a bad idea to have fun for one night, right, Midoriya? She asked sweetly, to the younger man who could use a good time after all the daily work, it's the least he deserves. Izuku awkwardly nodded. I agree, plus it's entertaining to be in the company of others, he replied with a charming smile, making his way without overshadowing the blush on his cheeks. She felt something warming up inside her but ignored it in favor of enjoying this moment with the pleasant and sweet guy. Cheers, she said softly, placing her martini in front of him. He, with a smile similar to hers, brought his beer bottle closer. Cheers, he responded before both gently clinked their glasses in a toast, taking sips from their respective drinks. The noise from her tablemates caught the attention of both of them, and they smiled resignedly with a touch of amusement before trying to get them to lower the volume. Frankly, she's fine with this, spending time having fun, sharing some drinks in good, and noisy, company, and enjoying a pleasant conversation with the young but mature hero by her side. What harm could it do to go along with it and have a bit more to drink? The warm rays of the sun made their way through the curtains, illuminating her face, disturbing her sleep and bringing her back to consciousness with some difficulty. She wanted to continue resting, but a slight headache made that impossible. She winced uncomfortably. Her heavy eyelids managed to open after a few seconds, and she covered her face with an arm, trying to shield her sensitive eyes from the daylight. What time is it? She didn't care much moments later when she settled back in bed, cradling against something warm beside her under the sheets, feeling quite comfortable for some reason. She didn't take long to open her eyes in panic when she realized she was without clothes, and most importantly, not alone in the bed. Uh-oh. She silently screamed, grabbing the sheet to cover herself as she moved away from the person sleeping in the bed. Nervous and incredulous, she got out of bed with a brief complaint caused by the slight discomfort in her sides and legs. She ignored that in favor of staring perplexedly at the young green-haired man, which wasn't hard to identify, it's Deku. What did I do? Why is Midoriya in my bed? She wondered, her alarmed and flushed expression surveying the room, which was a mess, to say the least. Then another realization hit her. Where am I? Now she was truly lost, looking around the bedroom that definitely wasn't hers. After a few seconds of inhaling and exhaling, she managed to calm down enough to maintain some level of composure. Although it's a difficult task when her gaze noticed more and more details around her, like her scattered clothes on the floor as well as the green-haired guys. She ignored the warmth building up on her face due to the slight discomfort in her temples accompanied by nausea, symptoms she remembers well from drinking too much on previous occasions. It was then that the memories of the previous night slowly began to return to her. She had been drinking with Midoriya and the others until late. That would explain her hangover, however, from a certain point, her memory began to blur and become more confusing. Then another pang in her head made her groan softly, cursing having drunk too much. Her attention finally settled on the sleeping young man who continued to rest with his back to her. Unlike her, he wasn't completely covered, as he wore dark boxers. Seeing him without his clothes, she was mesmerized, appreciating the worked muscles of the young man who breathed softly in his sleep. Her cheeks warmed, and her eyes widened nervously when she noticed the marks of her nails that had scratched his broad back. Once she saw how she marked him, she inspected herself in a mirror on the wall, gasping when she noticed marks on her shoulders and collarbone as well as hickeys on her neck. He marked her too. Red took over her face at the realization, she really had spent an intimate night with Midoriya. How would she face Nehire in the eyes after this? Ryuko, San? Izuku's sleepy and gentle voice called her name. Startled, she turned to see him behind her, looking confused as he rubbed his eye lazily. She realized she was in her birthday suit, covered carelessly by the sheet. Midoriya, she exclaimed embarrassed, throwing the closest thing she had at hand which happened to be an alarm clock, hitting him right on the forehead. Whoa! he yelled, falling backward from the sudden hit, eventually tumbling off the bed without any grace. Ryuko quickly covered her body with the entire sheet while Izuku got up, slightly disoriented, and rubbed his forehead. WH what's wrong, Ryuko-san? His kind green eyes and the concern in his voice, calling her by name again, made her strangely happy. But she mentally slapped herself to shake off those thoughts. T this is wrong, very wrong, she began quietly, holding her head with one hand and securing the sheet with the other to prevent it from falling. Izuku placed the alarm clock on a table as he approached her slowly. 
Ryuko-san, are you okay? He asked gently, extending a hand to comfort her. She grimaced, looked away, and took a few steps back, signaling him to stop. P please don't come near me, she said with a distressed tone that shocked him and widened his eyes. The room was filled with tense and uncomfortable silence in a matter of seconds, during which neither of them spoke. Ryuko was still trying to organize her thoughts, and hearing her name from him didn't help. Izuku, on the other hand, remained in place, recovering from her impactful request. What did I do last night? He asked seriously after a couple of minutes of silence, trying to remember how she ended up having relations with him when initially they were just drinking with others. How did they end up like this? Izuku looked puzzled by her question, and after a few seconds, his sad gaze fell to the floor. You. Don't remember? He asked in a silent lament that Ryuko could hear, but her silence was already a sufficient answer for the green-haired guy, who, distressed, began to refresh her memory. They had spent several hours drinking and chatting at the pub. The clientele had dwindled in the last hour, and the staff seemed to be preparing to close soon. At the back table, the group of professionals continued to enjoy their jovial gathering. Some were noticeably affected by the influence of alcohol, but that didn't stop them from ordering more drinks and having fun sharing nonsense with each other. Interestingly, Tamaki, Shinya, and Izuku had consumed the least alcohol in the group and remained sober in contrast to the others at the table. At some point, Ryuko, who had taken off her black coat, leaned toward the green-haired guy next to her, causing him to stiffen. You're quite cute when you're nervous, Midoriya, the flirtatious woman commented with a smile to the blushing boy who seemed to have trouble responding. Nehire jumped in her seat to hug the boy's arm. Isn't he? It makes me want to kiss him, she said joyfully and drunkenly, unaware that her breasts pressing against Izuku increased his blush, reaching his ears. I volunteer for the task, Rumi exclaimed, raising her hand clumsily, about to go to Midoriya to do her duty, but she was stopped by Edgeshot, who, with an exasperated sigh, made her sit back down. Control yourself, Mirko, the ninja hero scolded his colleague, who responded with incoherent and poorly constructed sentences before forgetting the matter and drinking the last bit of beer in her mug. To Izuku's surprise, Ryuko pulled him by the arm to bring him closer and cradle his head in her neck. I'm afraid you can't touch this, Rumi, he's mine, declared the beautiful yellow-eyed woman with a smile as she embraced Deku's head as if it were her property. Izuku began to stammer embarrassed, and Nehire would have complained if she weren't laughing at Tamaki for no particular reason. You're quite lively, Tatsuma-san, Mirio exclaimed, amused before bursting into spontaneous laughter. He, too, had been intoxicated by drinking so much. The dragon heroine showed no shame as she lifted the nervous cinnamon roll's chin so he could see her eyes. Isn't it obvious? Dragons are very territorial when it comes to what catches our attention. The blonde joked with a seductive air as she slowly brought her face closer to Izuku's. If only they would get a little closer. The young hero made a tremendous effort to subtly pull away from Ryuko's hands and stood up, visibly tense with a deep blush covering his cheeks. Deku sighed, trying to calm himself as much as possible, but Ryuko's charming gaze complicated it. I I think it's time to go, Nehire, Izuku said to his roommate with a small smile, while Ryukyu couldn't hide her amusement at seeing him so nervous. Eh? but I want to keep having fun with everyone. Nehire complained childishly, pouting like a little girl, making her look even cuter. Izuku smiled to himself before shaking his head. You drank too much, tomorrow your head will hurt, he said more sternly before taking her hand and making her stand with little resistance from the bluish-haired girl, who smiled radiantly at the gesture. The young man with tousled curls left his and Nehire's share of the bill on the table said brief but friendly goodbyes to everyone at the table until his eyes met Ryuko's, causing his cheeks to redden again. With a clumsy smile, he inclined his head in an attempt to say goodbye. Let's go, he told Nehire at his side, taking her by the wrist towards the exit. Goodbye, everyone, Nehire exclaimed happily and a bit dizzy, waving an arm in the air to bid farewell to her friends. Wait, you too, Ryuko said, capturing the attention of both, who stopped and turned to look at her with different degrees of curiosity as well as those still sitting at the table. The woman smiled confidently before standing up, grabbing her coat, and taking her share of the bill from her wallet to leave it on the table. Once done, she began to model her figure towards the two, highlighting her slender legs when she stood right next to Izuku, embracing his free arm and pulling him away from Nehire. 